Hey, Charlie Pyatt here. Last episode, I got the 3D printed test parts of the ARVR enclosure dry fit together. After some filing, dremeling, and CAD edits, all the parts are fitting in place pretty well. This round is going to be all about getting the finished parts together for the final assembly. Because I'm 3D printing parts at home and ordering carbon fiber sheet stock parts from an outside vendor for this project, I want to do some planning to make sure everything comes together smoothly. Ideally, I want to be working on getting those 3D printed test parts done and cleaned up while any external parts are being delivered, so I won't have any downtime waiting for things to come in before I can do the final assembly. To help with this, I'm going to be creating a bill of materials or BOM for tracking all the various parts. There are a lot of details to track down on this, so let's get to it. So my first step is going to be getting a final BOM together for this project. A bill of materials is just an itemized list of parts and quantities for each component on the project. Once this is generated, I can use it to get together any parts I need to order and track my 3D prints to make sure I don't lose track of anything. Pretty much all parametric software has some ability to create drawing packages with a BOM. This includes Fusion 360. I touched very briefly on drawings in Fusion 360 way back in episode 3, and this is going to be a similar process of bringing in the 3D CAD data into a 2D drawing space. Unfortunately, to be brutally honest, as of right now, Fusion 360 just doesn't have a very strong drawing package and bomb creator in its current version. Because of that, I'm going to use Fusion to make a very basic bomb table and then immediately export it as a CSV file. That way I can sort things out in Google Sheets or Excel instead of fighting with Fusion to get a simple part count together. Generally, this isn't good work practice because it breaks the parametric link between the BOM and the actual CAD assembly. So if I go back and make a edits to the 3D model, there is no way for the external spreadsheet to update. Not good if multiple people or teams are working on a project, but since I'm doing this solo, it's really not a big deal. I'm also exporting all my 3D CAD as a final step file here too, but I'll talk more on that in a little bit. Back in Google Sheets, I'm going to isolate my hardware into a single page of my spreadsheet. This is all McMaster car screws, nuts, and threaded inserts that are going to go into a single shipment. I sort these out and add all the redundant parts together to get my final counts. Later on, I look up each part and check their package quantities to make sure I'm ordering enough. So if I need 20 screws and they only come in packs of 10, I need two packs. There are some ways to streamline and automate this, but there's only like 12 line items here, so once everything's sorted and counted, I can just do the orders by hand. But yeah, otherwise that handles all the basic hardware needed for the project. So when I saved out my CSV file, I also exported a version of the 3D model for Rhino. I'm moving out of Fusion at this point because I need to get my parts sorted into separate groups containing the hardware, the carbon fiber parts, and the 3D printed parts. My Fusion model is structured in a way that makes doing this a real pain, so it's just easier to move everything into a direct modeling software package at this point. With my parts in Rhino, I'm going to start grouping them into my various layer types. I'm also color coding the parts to make it easier for me to visually make sense of what's going on. In this case, I'm making the off-the-shelf hardware blue, the carbon fiber prints gray, and the 3D printed parts some kind of pink. Once I have the parts grouped on their correct layers, I'm going to make a copy of my carbon fiber parts and lay them out so they're all flat in 3D space. These parts are going to be machined out on a CNC machine, and in this case I'll just be sending the fabrication house a 2D vector line work of each carbon fiber part. All I have to do once I have my carbon fiber parts laid out is make a copy of the border of each ground facing plane. This will result in my vector line work for cutting. I'm also exploding out my 3D printed parts so I can keep track of them in 3D space. I need to export each one of these parts as an individual STL mesh file for printing and there are going to be 43 printed parts in this assembly, which is a lot to keep track of. I ended up making a grasshopper script to sort and save these files so I didn't go crazy trying to keep track of them all. But yeah, you can see everything's copied and laid out for production here. I think we're looking good to move on to 3D printing. I sent my vector files off to be cut out of 2mm carbon fiber sheet stocks, so now I'm going to start prepping my parts for 3D printing locally. All the 3D printing is being done on a Formlabs SLA resin printer, so I'll be using their proprietary preform layout software here. With this many parts, it gets a little tricky getting everything together. I want to make sure I'm maximizing my build space so the machine has to run in as few batches as possible to get my finished 3D printed parts. In this case, I'm also kind of keeping things grouped by the part of the enclosure they're in. So I have the main enclosure, the left and right headphones, and the rear assembly. 
I ended up with six print sessions total. At high resolutions, these print times are going to range from 8 hours up to 33 hours. That's a pretty painful range of print times, but there's not much I can do about it. My plan is to run my quicker print sessions first. These have more small parts in them, which will need more manual cleanup, so I can at least work on those while the other longer prints are running. You can see a lot of what I'm doing is juggling lead times and trying to fill in those gaps with tasks that take manual labor. So while my carbon fiber parts are being fabricated, I'm 3D printing. While the later 3D printing sessions are running, I'm cleaning, finishing, and dry fit testing the earlier round of prints. If I were to reverse those steps, this whole process might go from taking a week to taking a month or more. Even on small personal projects like this, it's important to think about staging and sequencing to keep the build on track. In any case, with the layouts taken care of, it's time to print. These parts are going to be printed in Formlab's Tough 2000 resin, which has mechanical properties similar to ABS plastic. It's fairly rigid, but with good flex attributes, so if parts get dropped, they are less likely to shatter. This resin also cleans up pretty well and is less likely to chip if I need to sand or dremel it out in places. I'm not going to show all the print sessions, but the larger parts are looking pretty nice rising out of the resin in time lapse. You can see all the support material used in there as well. Large parts like this often need to be oriented at strange angles to fit in the print area. Support material is basically wasted resin, so it's a good thing to try and minimize to keep the print cost down. I was also paying attention to which side of each part was oriented towards the support in these builds. Every support will need to be removed and sanded down, so I try and keep the external surfaces facing away from the support side and as clean as possible. Print orientation is always a balance of trying to minimize the number of supports and limit the number of supports going to the more visible areas of a part. Each of the parts gets removed from the build platform and washed in an isopropyl alcohol bath. They are then put in a heated UV light box for final curing, which you can see here. This step sets the final mechanical properties of the finished parts. After about an hour in the light box, the supports get broken or trimmed off, and the part is ready to be finished sanded and painted. As I mentioned before, most of the supports on these parts are on the internal B side, so I won't have to do as much sanding and prep work on these before painting. Here you can see the cure box finished and open with the cure complete on the front bezel of the enclosure. The parts are looking great coming out of the final finishing steps. The resolution is so high that the step height striations on the surface of the 3D print are almost invisible. It's so great to finally have the finished parts in hand. So I was finishing up work on the last round of printing, the carbon fiber parts came in. These came out really nice. Carbon fiber is pretty well known for being difficult to machine, it tends to get burrs along the edge, and degrades cutting tools very quickly. But yeah, these look great, and they all have a nice clean edge, and the tolerances are spot on. All in, these parts were around $50 with shipping, so I can't complain about that. Turned out there were a few places that machine carbon fiber flat parts for custom drone frames out there. These shops were set up to handle just these size parts, which really helped keep the price down. It's always nice to be able to leverage economies of scale and in other industries for projects. It lets you bring unexpected and unique materials into the project that can really make a concept stand out. But yeah, all in all, I couldn't be happier with the way these are looking. You can see I started to test fit the carbon fiber parts with my 3D printed components. Each of these parts need to have a tolerance built into them so that they fit together. So like if I have a carbon fiber part with a 10 millimeter hole in the center, I can't have a 3D printed cylinder that has a 10 millimeter diameter fitting into it. The 3D printed cylinder would have to be like 9.8 millimeters wide or something similar for each of those two parts to fit together. Each manufacturing process will have uh, different tolerances, so coming up with something that works always requires a bit of testing and, in this case, uh, a little guesswork. Fortunately, this is all looking great. I had some parts that were a little tight in the headphone area and needed to be sanded down, but otherwise this is all really good. I still have to paint the 3D printed parts, and that layer of paint will make things even tighter, but I feel like everything should still be okay. It's just so amazing to finally see all these parts fitting together. I'm also testing out some of the buttons on the Oculus Quest that are being interacted with through a 3D printed part. They aren't perfect, but you can hear the clicking that happens when I press the button on the 3D print, which is always a good sign. I think I'm going to tweak the CAD on these slightly and do a reprint to get these a little bit better. These parts are so small that it really isn't a big deal. The print will only take a few hours at high resolution, so no problem. 
Could have done these in a cheaper clear resin at a lower resolution and saved some time maybe, but with precision fitting like this I'd rather stick with the final resin and resolution. All that aside, the switches are feeling really good so I don't think I'll have to do anything crazy here. Now that I have all my parts from the rear assembly, I can test the mechanics here as well. This uses a bearing stack and worm gears to tighten the paracord that will go into the back enclosure. You can see I spin these knobs and it rotates the inner wheels. One wheel knob combination is for the top adjustment and the other set is for the tightness on the sides. The worm gear prevents the cassettes from unspooling when the cords are put under tension. I did zero testing or prototyping on these and they seem to be working which is absolutely crazy. Kind of can't believe I got away with that, but it's fine by me. The action is a little stiff on these, but once I get everything painted and assembled, I will add some thread grease on these and they should be much smoother. I hope the grease doesn't allow the gear to skip out of the worm screw, but we'll see what happens when that's all put together. I probably should have also put a metal bushing on some of these parts to make the action a little smoother and a little bit more wear resistant, but eh, I'm sure it'll be fine. So there we have it. All the parts are ready for final painting and assembly. I still need to go through and make some minor adjustments to some of the smaller components, but that should go pretty quick. I also have all my McMaster hardware in, so there's nothing left to order or wait on. It's so exciting to finally have everything sitting here in front of me, ready to be assembled and tested. So this has been a really great session. Getting this point puts me in the home stretch for finishing this project. It's been a long time going from that first sketch concept to this complete design, but it's all coming together. The next episode, I'm going to do the threaded insert installation and final dry assembly for everything for testing. After that, I'll get into painting and finishing of the parts. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.